WXXO Studio, Hamilton, Ontario. This is a Barbershop Podcast. This is uh, your host, Kevin Barber, uh, bringing you some of the most uh, interesting, fascinating people in the uh, world of music from this corner of the world and now in your corner of the world, thanks to the interweb. Uh, I'm here with uh, co-host, producer, all-around great guy, Ryan Cannon. Ryan? Hello, everybody. How's it going today? Excellent. Excellent is right. Excellent. You ever get jacked up about the show tonight? Yeah. Hi. Other than I'm yellow because my fucking webcam broke and I gotta use the shitty internet one now. So but. Ryan's got the shyster cam today. He doesn't <laughs> look as pretty as he does normally. A little yellow. Yeah. But a man who isn't yellow and who does look pretty, we've got him uh, <laughs> really happy to have him in the studio. Uh, tonight is uh, Steve Nagus. Uh, Steve Nagus is a proud Hamilton lad and, uh, you know, he's covered uh, all aspects of the music. He's been... Uh, touring in the stadium shows and he's been uh, producing the independent acts and he's been gigging in the ale houses and and um, writing and uh, you've been keeping busy haven't you Steve you name it I've just about done everything I can think of so yeah so tell me about ask everyone this question um, music has obviously become your life at what age like when did it come when did it really get its hooks into you well I think I, I really got into music when I was about eight or nine and uh, I, I wanted to play drums, and I had my first drum kit in my first band when I was 12. And that was a, a couple of weeks back, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Still fresh in your mind. And yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's what I always wanted to do. I, I, it's funny, because I grew up uh, just outside of Hamilton in Grimsby, and I used to look across the lake and go, oh, there's Toronto over there. I want to go there. Yeah, the bright lights, big city. That's it. If you're making music, uh, Toronto's the place to be in, in Ontario, obviously. Yeah. So as soon as I finished high school, I uh, moved to Toronto. I was actually a management trainee for the Bank of Montreal. Now, that was your future. It was all laid out for you, right? You were going to get into high finance. It was. I mean, they asked me, they said, you can't stay in Grimsby. It's too small. And I went, oh, great. So first thing they did is they said, well, how about Toronto? And I went, cool. Greater. <laughs> Let's go. So that was about 1970, I think it was. And uh, I spent two years in the, working for the bank as a management trainee and realized that it's really boring. Yeah. So uh, at the same time, I had a gig in a country band at a house gig. So I was playing six nights a week and a Saturday matinee as well as working in the bank. Right. So I used to come home, take my suit off, and then go play country music. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so at, at what point did you, I mean, you you, 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 you were the drummer for, for Sega. And right. Sega is when most people, you know, connect your name with a band that made it. And in Canada, some people were so very proud of it. Um, um, an entity like that getting international recognition. But leading up to that, um, was there a point when you knew that this is what I'm going to do with my life, or did you try to live that double life for a long time? Well, continuing on with the, when I, after having moved to Toronto, uh, two years in the bank, and I looked around the bank, I had two weeks to go to write my accountant's examination. And uh, I just looked around the branch and I went, you know, I don't want to be here. So I quit. I gave two weeks notice instead of writing this exam. <laughs> and uh, I went, I want to play music. If uh, I went, to, It's funny because I went to my bank manager's house. And he lived in this shoebox, in, in stucco shoebox with like one bedroom or something. And he had been a manager for the bank. He had worked for the bank for like 20 odd years. And I went, you know, if this is what I got to look forward to, I'd rather play music. If I'm going to be poor, I'd rather do something I like to do. <laughs> be <Happy and> poor. <laughs> so I quit. And uh, the first thing I did was I went to Long and McQuaid's in Toronto. And they have a bulletin board with uh, bands looking for musicians. Right. And I picked three numbers off the board. And one was uh, a 1950s rock and roll band just starting out doing all 50s stuff. And I went, I, that was one of the bands I called. The other one was a band called Greaseball Boogie Band. Do you remember them? No. You don't remember them? No. They were another 50s band. Okay. And uh, so I ended up getting a gig with this band called Bananas. And uh, 
within two years, it became one of the top show bands in Toronto. Now, at this point, I, I wouldn't say that I was totally serious ab about being a drummer at that point. It was all about chicks and parties, and, you know, it was really cool to be playing in a band, and I was playing my first uh, full-time gig was uh, a place called the Brass Rail on Young Street. Yeah, quite and famous. I, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it, and it was just in the, the transition then from being a topless go-go bar to having bands. So we got our first house gig there, and, and we played six nights a week uh, with the Saturday matinee. Ridiculous sets. I think we did like six sets a night, and we had like 15 uh, three-minute uh, 50s rock and roll songs. <laughs> So we played them to death, and they still had the Go-Go Girls. So we used to use, you know, the vamp from uh, Rock Around the Clock? Yep. Dum, 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 bum, bum, ba -da -da -da. We played that four times a set. Right. We played it to start the set, to bring the Go-Go Girls on, to get them off. And, and then at the end of the set, we'd play it again, because we were way short of material. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was funny. Uh, the first week we were there, they gave us bar tabs. Big mistake. Big mistake. So we're all going, yeah, let's drink tons. So we, at the end of the week, we owed them money. <laughs> People think that that's, you know, when they see it in the Blues Brothers, that that's a joke, but that's happened, you know. Oh, it's it's the real stuff. I mean, yeah. Spinal Tap even. Yeah. I, that The first time I saw that movie, it was painful. Yeah. I mean, I can remember wandering around corridors and buildings trying to find the flipping stage <laughs> and, and uh, you know, <laughs> there'd be yeah. some janitor yeah. going, oh, you go this way. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was painfully true. I mean, yeah. uh, oh, it was brutal to watch that. Yeah, and your body can only take so much of that playing, you know, even if you're not doing the day job, playing six sets is going to be, you know, exhausting. Yeah, well, I was very young and, and energetic at that point. I uh, don't think I could do the same now. No. You know, my energy levels. I don't think I want to tour like I used to. <laughs> you know, I, we would go out for six, seven, eight months in a row. Right. I mean, I can remember one year when I was home about two weeks in the whole year. You know, mm. the rest of the time I was off in England recording or I was off somewhere else uh, rehearsing and writing. And then I'd go on tour, and it would be months and months and months and months, you know. So you've uh, you built your reputation as a, as a drummer. People came looking for you. I mean, this is what happens uh, with any musician who earns his, his keep. Um, and you, you imagine you're playing in a number of different outfits at a certain point. Yeah, it didn't used to be like that, because in the, uh, in the 70s, uh, the clubs were still packed. Yeah. So you could play six nights a week, and we played six nights, sometimes seven, 40-odd weeks a year. And we made great money doing it. Yeah. I mean, you could do that back then. Now, I mean, you can play a club one night a week, and there's hardly anybody there. It's, so you, you can't survive just doing one band. Back then, you used to be, you become part of a band, right. right? And you would play a circuit. Well, that the circuit thing is completely gone now. Uh, the smoking laws and the drinking laws have just really killed that scene completely. Yeah, and and, and people have a hard time <laughs> making that, you know, admitting to that, you know. And I have, you know, pictures where when Ryan and I were playing, you know, we're smoking on stage. This was 2003, you know, but it was almost to the day when those laws came in that that live music scene dried up. It did, and, and also uh, in the old days, too, we used to do a lot of high schools. Yeah. You know, you'd go do one-nighters, and they were great gigs. Uh, that scene went away when the drinking age lowered to 18. 18. Yeah. And so up and down, you know, uh, what were the hot streets in, in Toronto to play it during those? Well, Young time? Street was definitely the hot yeah. street. You know, I used to play, uh, uh, in Saga days, I played the gas works a lot. And there was a whole, Bramer uh, owned the gas works, and he owned a boat seven or eight other clubs the generator the forge the coal bin mm -hmm. they're all similarly named right and uh then further downtown obviously you had the brass rail i used to go and sit in it at, at uh, the bermuda tavern and next door to that was the zanzibar mm -hmm. so I, I used to go sit in with paul schaefer all the time really yeah he had a house gig there and and 
they still had the topless dancers yep. and they had three bands one would start at noon till four then a second band would come in at just after four and, and play till like 8 30 and then a third band would come in at 8 30 and play till one o'clock so uh any afternoon on any given day you can go i want to go sit in and play some music and go sit in and back up some uh some topless dancers yeah and the players were great yeah they had some really great players in there you can't help but get good when you're playing that much yeah it's true it's a, you you and repetitively playing successfully because it's you want to continue to play and there's a reason to to play you know beside your passion there's days that maybe you don't want to when you're doing that many hours but if the paycheck is there and you're having a good time then why wouldn't you yeah and i don't think i was ever particularly uh career driven i mean all the decisions i made so uh we'll kind of back up a bit yeah. uh I played in Bananas for two years, and they became, like I say, one of the top uh, show bands, which was basically the flavor of the, the day. Everybody did cover stuff right. in Toronto. <clears throat> and then I heard a band called Tower of Power, and I was just so moved by that music, I had to play it. Yeah. So I quit Bananas, and I put together an R&B band. Mm hmm and uh, I ended up going, I did a whole summer up at Wasega Beach at the Dardanella. Yes. And it's just like 73, 74, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, it's funny, because I had the six-piece R&B band. So I had uh, two black singers. I had uh, Betty Richardson, and I had this guy, Otis Gale, who was nicknamed Leroy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and the horn section. There know, was no horn no, section. No, really? How did you cover that? This was Wicked Guitars? and Yeah, like I said, we had two singers, and we had uh, Val Bent playing guitar. He was a black guy. Yeah. And then we had the three white guys who didn't sing. So there was myself, a uh, keyboard player named George Bland, and uh, suitably named. <laughs> and we had uh, this bass player, Rick Burkett. All great players. Yeah. but uh, So it was an interesting thing because... Uh, the guy who owned the club was a com complete maniac. He was just crazy retired guy. He used to spend his winters in Florida, and then he would run his club in the summer. Right. So <clears throat> this whole summer became such a fiasco, it was unbelievable. Leroy gets hemorrhoids. <sighs> what does he do? He goes to the doctor, and he's too embarrassed to tell the doctor he's got hemorrhoids. <laughs> <laughs> he tells the doctor he's constipated. The doctor gives him a laxative. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> Two weeks later, he's in a hospital getting yeah. his roids removed. Mm -hmm. yeah. But he had a... Uh, uh, she, she got herself pregnant, so she went off to get an abortion. So now my... <laughs> my six-piece... Your band's going to hell! <laughs> <laughs> my six-piece R&B band's down to four. Oh, yeah, and, and three of them are white guys. Yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> so Val is the only guy left who sings. Yeah. He decides to do Angel Dust one night. So he halfway through the set, he's falling back against his amp. He can't play. He can't even stand up. <laughs> so we're walking him around outside, and he's going... But why do I exist? <laughs> <laughs> to play this fucking set. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so I knew I was in trouble. Now my six-piece R&B band's down to the three white, white guys. guys who don't sing. <laughs> Fortunately, uh, in the old days, there used to be, uh, there was the Windjammer and the Dardanella. Uh, they were across the street from each other and both had bands. And there was a, another black singer, a guy named the Mighty Pope. And he had a gig across the street. Of course, we were very, they were comrades. So we, we would go and sit in with them and they would sit in with us. Right. So the Mighty Pope would basically do his set, run across the street and do our set. And then run back and do his own <laughs> set so that we could get through this. Kid. That's out of a movie. That's fantastic. Oh, so yeah, Spinal Tap. Yeah. Oh, it's really. So at the end of the summer, we all went, I don't think we're staying together, guys. I don't think any of us want to do this anymore. <laughs> so that was my R&B band. It was called Shelter. And uh, at the end of the summer, after six months, it was Sega Beach. We just went, you know, let's pack it in. And uh, 
I got a gig with uh, a guy named David Bendeth, yes. who has since moved on and now is in New York. He became a big A and R guy for uh, I think it's Warner Brothers. Yeah. So I was playing with him, and he was a complete Jeff Beck maniac. You know, he had the little talk box and all, all the stuff. And I took him down. We used to go and sit in at another club in Toronto. Do you remember the Lecoq Door? Yes, I do. So I used to go and sit in with all the R&B bands because, I mean, R&B just turned my crank. That's really yep. what I love to play. So I would sit in with Tavares and the President's Band, and, and it'd be like, 10 guys up there and then they used to call me blue-eyed soul brother yeah they liked what you did yeah and i go i don't have blue eyes what are you talking about <laughs> close enough <laughs> y'all look the same that's it so i took uh dave bendit down there and, and it changed his life too mm. and, and then he went on to uh have some pretty good success on his own with uh, some r&b stuff that he used some really heavy players on yeah and uh, so that was short-lived, and then I joined uh, Grant Fullerton. Yes. Do you remember Grant? Yes, I still, yeah. Now, Grant, uh, the first time I saw Grant was at my high school, and he was playing with, uh, what was the band called? Uh, Stitch in Time. Mm -hmm. And I always remembered him. I mean, he's a very charismatic guy. But, I, you know, I was in high school. I was very impressionable. And I remember he used to tap his foot sideways. You know, of course, you know, when you see that on a big stage, you know, you're, you're way down low and you're looking up and this guy's tapping his foot sideways. You go, oh, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah, I got to do that. <laughs> so he also played with Lighthouse for a while. And uh, so I hooked up with him and, and uh, it was a band called Fullerton Dam. And we had this manager who was... Uh, 350 pounds plus. He was a, an ex-wrestler from L.A. I think he used to own the Troubadour in L.A. And this guy was a, a diabetic and didn't take the insulin. So he would go from completely calm to a raving maniac in like five seconds. Mm -hmm. And he hated me. <laughs> <laughs> Something. <clears throat> <clears throat> so... <laughs> I can remember this one one time we were, we were doing some recording at Eastern Sound in Toronto, and uh, Kenny Friesen was the engineer, who I think he won Engineer of the Year award right around that time for Anne Murray. He used to do Anne Murray and Gordon Lightfoot, and I'd gone in, I'd set up my drums, and I got them all sounding great. But this uh, at that time the the cardboard box was fashionable. Yeah. For drum sound, sounds, yeah, right. And I was playing rock, so I had this really nice open old Ludwig kit, and everything was just nice and open and sounded great. I went out for a coffee after I'd set up, and he, I came back, and he had taped all the drums, and I was ready to kill him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was so upset when he won Engineer of the Year award because he was awful. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, that was. Uh, that was with Grant and this this maniac manager, and and uh, I, w I did that for about two years. Then I was uh, I just split up with my lady, and I was staying at uh, Larry's Hideaway. Yeah, you remember Larry's? Very Hideaway? famous. Yeah. yeah, I was actually staying at that place. Really? I, yeah, the they, they don't officially have rooms there. It's just uh... well, they <laughs> 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 it was pretty shady. Yeah. <laughs> But to actually be living there was really unbelievable, yeah. the stuff that was going on there. And I, I was playing Larry's Hideaway, and an old friend of mine actually had the, the drumming gig with Flood. Mm -hmm. Like J.R. Flood? Uh, no, no, Flood. Mm, okay. Just Flood. Uh, for the Cousin Mary fame. Okay. And uh, the whole band came in except the drummer. And the drummer was really the only guy I knew really well. So I'm sitting with Brian Pilling, who's no, no longer with us. And uh, he says, yeah, we're looking for a new drummer. I said, oh, yeah, who you got in mind? He says, he's sitting right here. I said, oh, okay. So you're offering me the gig. And I, I had spent two years with Grant slugging it out. And uh, so I said, well, give me a week to think about it. And I, But I decided to, to go do it. It made sense. Mm -hmm. So I quit Grant's band, and, and I joined Flood. 
Now, Brian had leukemia, and uh, his re he, had, he was in remission, but his remission broke down about eight or nine months into the band, so uh, he got really sick in a hurry, and, and uh, that was basically the end of the band. So the rhythm section, which was myself, uh, Jimmy Crichton, and Peter Roshan, uh, stayed together to put the the early version of Saga together, which was called Pockets. Right. And uh, this is about 76, late 76. So, uh, yeah, Flood was basically done at that point, right. and Brian died about eight or nine months later. Now, with Pockets, how much did Pockets... Um <clears throat> Hark to Saga was it was it was it a natural progression from one band into the other or was was there um, characters or people in the band who came in to change the the no, sound and the direction? It, it was all the same guys. I mean, basically, Pockets was Saga. It's just that we had to change the name because of some black band in the states already had the name. Okay. So when we came to record our first album, uh, we couldn't use the name. They told us we couldn't use it, so we had to come up with something else. And, and one of our brilliant managers said, well, how about Saga? So and we went, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> now, fast forward a, a little bit. Um, the band has started, and so you've, you've, you've lugged a lot of years. You've been band leader. You've, you've kind of gone from your progression of being a, um, a demand studio musician to now you're you're in a band that's actually starting to get some traction um, um we want to get to some of the stuff that you're doing now and what you're playing but um there's so many people in today's music industry who've never had the opportunity to remember or live the life of what it was like when music really was king when it predated video and there was investments by record companies and a and r people in you and 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 there was a life that you didn't have to dig out yourself with a screwdriver and a, a rocky stone surface yes i call it the renaissance the renaissance <laughs> <laughs> the days when you could still make a living making music yeah yeah th they were great days so what was the you know did, was, was there like little flash points where you remember thinking oh my god you know, when I was a kid in Grimsby, looking across at the lights, I'm there now. You know, I'm, I'm, I've, I've. These things are are happening kind of magically now. Yeah, I think one of the biggest turning points was actually uh, headlining Maple Leaf Gardens. Yeah. Uh, I think the first time we did it, we was with Flood. We opened for ELO, and that was really cool. And that was my first time playing there. And then we uh, we started doing the New Year's gigs with Rush. Yeah. So it'd be Rush, Max Webster, and Saga, all in the same show for New Year's. Yeah. And uh, I, I think it was the second or third year into that, then uh, Rush didn't do it, and we headlined, and Kim opened. Kim Mitchell opened for us. And uh, I think that was the, the sort of real big turning point. In, in in my own eyes mm -hmm. because I had my parents picked up in a limo and, yeah. and driven into the back of the gardens and uh, uh, there was a, an agent from, from New York who was booking us, Barbara Skydell was there and I introduced my folks to her and, and of course they hit it off and they're talking about you know Barbados and holidays and yeah. so I, I think that was real turning point because when I actually quit the bank and, and decided to play music, they were devastated. Really? Oh, yeah, you know. Yeah, I guess most parents are of that generation, right? Exactly. You know. Exactly. It's the old school thinking, you yeah. know. You need something to fall back on and something that's reliable. And, yeah. And I absolutely understand that. You know, I, I do what I can, and my kids are like, I'm going to, you know, I'm not into math. I'm, a, I'm an artist, and she's eight. You know? <laughs> I go, you crazy? What are you doing? You're going to make me crazy. Yeah. Don't do this thing. Well, we're going we're gonna to play some music. We tend to chat a little bit at the beginning, and then we kind of shorten it up in between songs. But uh, you've, you've brought your most recent thing. We're going to go back and, and talk some stories, but I want you to kind of touch on um, your, and this is your latest project, uh, which is Dare to Dream. This is actually my first solo CD. Uh, 
in in the later days of Saga, um, for various reasons, that the band was trying to phase me out of the writing, mm-hmm. and they would go down and write the songs into a drum machine, and then I would actually have to record the drums after the fact, and I, that was very unsatisfying. Yeah. So I went, you know what, you you guys go do it. I'm I've had enough. And actually, a lot of the tunes that that are on this album, I originally wrote for Saga, and I don't think they even listened to them. No, and but you've you've always had like you're a producer. You've got a producer's ear, you know, when you when you write. So being part of the writing process, I mean, I can see how that's that's crucial to you. Um, and if you're not getting, that's not getting fed. You know, it's it's bonus for you, and it's bonus for us that you know that it, it lived to. to that you got to be the one to give birth to it you yeah know, as yeah. opposed to someone who maybe didn't give a shit that's as true much i, I th- think uh, i really think that, that people that get that are still making music are making it because they love it because you sure as hell can't make yeah. a living and <laughs> don't go in thinking it and don't go out thinking it well we're going to play the uh the title or the the lead off track lust lust which is you know i mean it's one word it says it all right you know if there's one thing better than love in the short term it's got to be lust right that's right all right i'm not gonna i'm not gonna lay any, any more on the line than that other than this is uh steve nagus this is his uh solo debut cd and this is lust on barbershop podcast barbershoppodcast.com
And that is Lust from Steve Nagus. That's a lusty song, Steve. I gotta say, song. I like that. That harks back to the saga sound. And if I was to describe that, you know, people talked about art rock or progressive rock, and it was difficult to put a, uh, you know, uh, pi- you know, pigeonhole it, something like that. But it had a, it was a real unique sound, and clearly you were a big part of that. You know, and again, yeah. when you talk about writing music, this is, um, you know, Ryan and I were just talking about that about wanting to play and like should we write to a, a, a drum machine and ryan said very explicitly he goes i like writing with a drummer you know because should we write first and then get the drummer or should we hire a drummer and write with the drummer and and as a bass player ryan and as a guitar player i totally appreciate when the rhythm section's writing because it, I could play garbage or I can come down and if someone's in a groove, it's amazing how easily I can play guitar <laughs> to a really good, really good groove, right? Yeah, I think that uh, all the all the technology is a mixed blessing on right across the board. There are things that are really cool. You have the ability to do a whole pile of things, but there are still some inherent things that, that, that work really well. And one of them is a bunch of musicians in a room hammering out a song. Because then you get the character of the players. Yeah. Whereas if you, uh, that's what exactly what Saga did to me is they took me out of the equation and started writing to a drum machine. And, and what they programmed was so flipping stiff yeah. that when I came to put drum tracks on it, it didn't have that funk thing that like yeah. my... As we talked, what you earlier. described, and this is exactly this is this is the the chromosomes that that make up who you are. Those little gigs and those passions that you felt for R and B and and Oakland soul and things like that. Exactly. Right? I mean, I spent so many years articulating my craft to have a style uh, that is different uh, from everybody else's. It's identifiable, mm-hmm. and it's not identifiable if it's done to some flipping drum machine. Yeah. Although I do love drum machines, for drummers, they're one of the best tools Yeah, because they teach you to play in the pocket, Mm -hmm. right? So you don't speed up and slow down. So again, it's that mixed blessing thing. Uh, In in a drummer's hands, a drum machine is a great tool. In a non-drummer's hands, uh, there's no way that you can program in that emotion and even the feel and the right stuff for the song so what you end up with is is kind of a milk toast version yeah. of what a drummer would do. Yeah, and, and that helped. And that happened to a lot of uh, music in the '80s, where both guitars and drums were synthed out. You mm-hmm. know, um, and and the and and the and the rigs changed quite dramatically. There was just these beautiful kits that weren't used, and everyone had to have an electronic drum kit, and everyone had to have that ping, ping, zing, zing sound, and. It well, the didn't f- last very long, did it? <laughs> no, that's it's actually funny because I was one of the first guys to do that. <laughs> 1980, I think it was, I was in England recording and I, I, uh, I saw this little tiny ad in a British trade magazine for this electronic drum kit. The company was called Simmons. And uh, they were just north of London, England. Uh, so I called them up. I said, I want to come see you. So I went to see them and there was three people There was uh, Dave Simmons, who was designing the stuff. There was this guy, Jeff Howarth, who was the sales guy. And there was this lovely woman, Daphne, who was like the all-around secretary. And they were building about three kits a month in the back of a music store in a place called St. Albans, which is kind of like Aurora to Toronto, just north. So I walked in, they showed me what they had. I played it and I went, oh, this is cool. I said, you're going to give me a kit. I'm going to use it on my next album because I was in England recording. And I'm going to make you a lot of money. And they went, okay. Sounds good. <laughs> so I did that. And, and that was actually uh, Worlds Apart, which was Saga's biggest selling yeah. album. It's just gone platinum in the States. Just sold, sold a million copies in the States. Um, and I used it on tracks like Wind Him Up and... There was a handful of tracks, but it was a new character sound. And it's funny because I came back and, and I brought the first kit back to Canada. Uh, in Actually, in all of North America, it was the first kit here. And then I phoned up all my buddies and I said, uh, I've got these electronic drums. They're fantastic. You want a kit? I phoned Neil Peart up mm-hmm. and he said, oh, no, I'm a purist. 
I'm not going to play electronic drums. Three years later, I yeah. he's, he's got them, <laughs> <laughs> and 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 they're not compact and 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 transistorized to the point that they are now. Like I imagine back then, it was quite a bit of gear to make something small, or was it tiny? Were they able to to, to make this like easily transportable? Well, it's interesting you say that because the first uh, the first version was a drum kit, and they were the hexagonal pads, mm -hmm. and the the surfaces were like tabletops. A lot of drummers got had problems from playing them because they're they don't don't have good control. technique, yeah. and their wrists they had you know carpal tunnel became an issue, and uh, but uh, I said to Dave Simmons, I said you know I'd really like to have this in a briefcase version, so he he built me a briefcase version which actually was a briefcase it was a, like a road case, and it had seven pads in it. And they were they were small ones. They were about this size, about the size of a coffee can lid. Mm -hmm. And uh, we put together this drum duet with Mike Sadler, the singer from Saga, and that became one of the most famous drum solos in Europe. Yeah, off of uh, it's off of um, the first live album, which was the first one of the first three CDs ever released in transit. And we recorded that in, in uh, Munich and Copenhagen. And uh, we recorded it digitally. And we had no idea what digital was no. at that point. And then we mixed it here in Canada at Phase One Studios. Uh, we had to fly in a machine from New York. And Especially this, to... This thing was the size of a frickin' refrigerator. It was huge <laughs> and came with three technicians. Yeah. Right? They, they didn't just send us the machine. Three guys came with it to keep it working. Yeah. <laughs> Shovel coal into it. <laughs> that's right. And uh, that's what we used to, to mix the tracks from this uh, digital live album. And we were signed to Deutsche Grammophon in Germany, uh, subsidiary of Polydor. And they were the big classical label. So uh, Philips was responsible for a lot of the CD technology at that point. So this is when it all started to change, right? Right. So there was uh, three releases of the first CDs ever available, and we were one of them, our live album. And the others were classical, right. classical albums. So that's when it all started to change. Yeah, you were real groundbreakers in that, you know, in that genre. Kind of, a, you had to be a bit fearless, you know, because you you were, you you had a uh, a brand. That was growing, you know, but it was based on that, right? It was based on that this was something that was edgy, you know, it had a sound that was new. Yeah, you know? I've always been fearless. When it comes to music, I know no fear. Yeah. Right? I would play with anybody, anywhere, anytime, and I didn't care how good they were, famous they were. It's like, hey, you're playing. In fact, I remember when I was really young, I hitchhiked to uh, Detroit. And I happened to get to downtown Detroit on Africa Day. And and there's a bunch of bands playing. And I'm going, can I sit yeah, in? <laughs> totally. Totally into Africa and Day. And they're going, we don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> and I go, yeah, but cool, this is cool. I want to play. <laughs> and they're going, no. At that point, I had no idea how nasty Detroit it was at that be. time. You're from Canada, and you just wanted to share the love, right? That's right. I was still in high school. Cool. You know what the hell was I yeah. thinking? Well, I've seen pictures of you. I mean, it's amazing. For like from very young age, when like you 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 played in you know in in serious bands for a long time, and you've taken that attitude where this is you know this is serious business, but clearly. You can't take it too seriously. You have to have a lightness about you. When you play, you're going to get ground down. You know? Yeah, I think all my motivation has been uh, musically driven. And I never I never thought of it as being career decisions. You know, I'm, I'm quitting this band that's making really great money. And I'm going to put together my own band. And I may not have any gigs for a while. It never even occurred. It's just, oh, I want to play that. Yeah. So I, sorry guys, I gotta go. And uh, all the way along, uh, it was never a case of, oh, is this a good career move? It's just, this is, I wanna play this. That's stuff. what you wanna do. Yeah. That's what you wanna do. Well, I wanna play something off of uh, uh, 
a friend and a friend of yours and uh, Jerry got a hold of me and he loved the name of the show because he had just put out a uh, CD and this is uh, Jerry Johnson and uh, he's a blues dude and I thought it kind of sounds like Frank Zappa meets uh, Mississippi John Hurt you know a little bit and uh, I, I like very much what he does but he did something called the Barber's Chair this is what the, his EP is called yeah and this is a Steve Nagus joined you worked this did yes you? basically I'm playing some shows with Jerry now uh, it's a, a, a trio, and uh, I've, this is actually the third album I've recorded for Jerry, uh, mostly as a producer-engineer role initially, but now I'm actually doing some gigs with him, too. He's just such a lovable guy, and uh, this was done in my studio, just uh, five minutes from here. Five minutes from here, and some of the hottest, most uh, active volcanic region of music <laughs> in southern Ontario. We're going to play uh, Barber's Chair, the title track, Barber's Chair from uh, Jerry Johnson. This is for you, Jerry, on uh, barbershoppodcast.com. Cool. So hot. Jerry, thank you so much for that. That's Jerry Johnson. You can get that CD, I think, at Dr. Disc and uh, or 
you know, get a hold of Jerry. He's get on Facebook. Get a hold of Jerry. He's on Facebook. He's got his own website. He's got his own website. He's a good guy and a hardworking musician. And you know what? That's the... Uh, you know, that's basically what it's made up of. You know, the people who are in the business, they tend to be good people. You know, you don't stick around in this business if you're a dickhead, do you? Well, some do. Some do, but I mean, not at the performance level. We you won't know? name they them. They do. <laughs> <laughs> you can. You've been around longer. You've got a good, you've probably got a bag full of them. It's come down to, uh, and, and it's something that I've never been particularly good at, but we call it shameless self-promotion. Yes. Right? And, and you have to be shameless about it. You do. I'm still not good at it. Uh, you know what? Ed, you got nothing to be, uh, you know, not to be shameless about. Quite often, I'm I hate to do it because I can't swing a cat without hitting so many great players. <laughs> and you want to hit them and go, "Oh my God, I shouldn't even be getting off my chair," you know. And, and but that, then again, I've seen other people. <clears throat> they can't tune their guitar, but they're showmen, you know. And they yeah. bring it, and they can promote, and they can get people to come out to the show. And you Absolutely, watch it and go, yeah. "That's that's Drek," you know. But it, they they can create the buzz, and yep. the buzz has always been a big part. Of it, right? That's true. It's so true. Yeah. And uh, I look at it and sometimes I go, you know, how, why can't I do that? But I, I still have a problem with it. But I, I guess I'm kind of old school in, in some ways. Certainly not from the, the technology or the no. recording. That part of it is like, bring it on. What What's new? What do you got? Yeah. If it makes noise, we'll use it, you yeah. know? But uh, when it comes to actual promotion. There's someone who should be doing that. Yeah. <laughs> You know, they're the yeah. specialty, and that's what they get off on, right? Yeah. But I think that, that part's been driven out of the business. This is something I've said before, that there used to be someone who would in, in genuinely enjoy music, and they would take a personal interest in it, and they would be passionate about music, and they would book the gigs, and they would get the money, and they would do put the posters up and do the promotion, and they would bring the people into the crowd, and they would make the bar owner happy, and they would make the bands happy. Yeah. And then at some point, the bar owner thought, oh, fuck, I don't need him. I can do this myself. And the band said, fuck, I don't need him. I can do this myself. And right. all of a sudden, now you've got thinning out the talent in, in the bands that you see out there, and you're thinning out the amount of money that the bar owners are paying. And they and, and it just weakens the whole pot where people don't, you can still find wonderful live music experience, but there isn't that middleman whose job it is, is to light that fire. To promote. Yeah. yeah. And most musicians are not great self-promoters. Yeah. I, I certainly am not, you know. Uh, when I look at all the things that I do well, Promotion isn't one of them, you know. Uh, I, I guess there's there's uh, I I talk I, I talk about it as being uh, forward thinking, like uh, you know I've got a whole pile of gold records from all the albums I've done with Saga and Krista Berg and a whole pile of stuff, and uh, the house I'm in now I've been there for almost f over four years. I still haven't put my flipping albums Yeah, up. They sit in a corner gathering dust, and I go, you know what? I'm not impressed. Uh, it's more about what I'm doing now and what I'm about to do is way more uh, important to me than what I've already done. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I am getting older, and I guess at some point I will reach the point when I start looking back at all the stuff I did. And go, you know, I got the Juno and I got the stuff and that's cool. But at this point, it's like, let's get What's on next? the next. Yeah. You know? And in, in that production, as you said, that is not, not, you know, you start developing that ear. You know, and it's like, you know you have a good ear and people tell you have a good ear. And then you start hearing things <laughs> and you go, I can, I can hear something better in that. And you've taken on that producer's role. What, you know, and I know for for me, I love the production much more than the engineering. You know, someone like Ryan has that wonderful balance between left and right brain. And me, you know, I get I get bored pretty easy tweaking knobs. Do you mm -hmm. have, you know, do you have that, that ability? Like, you, you dig into new gear and technology? Yeah, I mean, Saga being such a a leader from the technology standpoint with all the, the Moog synthesizers when they first came out. We had them all. In fact, uh, Moog at one point offered us an endorsement. He said, well, what are you going to do for us? We have everything you make. Yeah. yeah. And we're already using it. Uh, the, from a technologically technological standpoint, uh, no fear. But uh, from the, the other side of it, I, I, I don't mind twiddling knobs because we've done it so much to program mm -hmm. the synths. And uh, recording was just a, a logical next step. 
what I found is initially I got into engineering and producing mainly because I didn't like what engineers were doing to my drum sound. Yeah. They were destroying it. We talked earlier. Yeah, and when you mentioned the, uh, the cardboard box sound, it's like literally for 10 years, the sound sounded like, and I could think of like the first Teenage Head album, for example, that's exactly what Nick's drum kit sounded like as a yeah. cardboard box and that thin thin sound that somehow was the prevalent thought that no one thought about saying you know does that that doesn't sound like drums so if i'm at a show that's not what it sounds like exactly and yet it was accepted industry-wide it was and and it, i found that that point of it that point was really frustrating in that my sound has always been big and open and i spent years articulating the sound of my drums as i did my craft of playing them uh and I had a sound in mind that, that wasn't getting on to album. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the, some of my early recordings with some of the artists that we covered, uh, the drums were flipping awful. And, and then I went, you know, there's got to be an easier way, a better way to do this. And I'm not finding it so with the people I'm working with. So I have to go and, and do it myself. Because you know it can be done. You yes. Know, and they're going to tell you it can't for one reason or another. That's right. And it's not rocket science. It's yeah. really not that difficult to get a good drum sound if you know what, what you're looking for. Exactly. You know? On that note, I'm going to play the second tune off this, tu off this uh, CD. This is uh, Negus, Dare to Dream. And where's this available, Steve? Where can people get a hold of this? Uh, through my website, also through Facebook. If you contact me, uh, you will find it in a few stores, but mostly through me. Okay. Does online get a hold of Steve Negus? or get a hold of barbershoppodcast.com and take a look. We're going to have a link on the website. You mentioned uh, it was recorded uh, you were at the drums with this at the Jam House with uh, Tony Furtado, someone who, you know, we got a personal relationship with who's a, a, a excellent drummer in his own right and an engineer. He understands this stuff. So Tony, tell, tell me about how you set up the drums for this recording. I did a lot of work. Uh, at one point, I was talking to, with Tony about setting up my whole system there on a permanent basis. And uh, I wanted to switch it over from rehearsals to straight recording. And uh, I took my system down there and set it up. When, uh, that's when I started working with Jerry Johnson. His first album was recorded there. And uh, Brian Mello. Um, there were several bands. A lot of the bands that were rehearsing there, I was recording them. And when it came to doing my own album, I said, Tony, I want, I love the sound of this big room, the main room. Mm -hmm. I want to record my drums there. I need about two weeks. So I set up my drums in the middle of the room. Uh, uh, at that time, I set up 20 microphones on the drum kit. Uh, 20 mics is, is, is a fair number of microphones. It is. Now, but what's your, what's your, what's your kit look like these days? It uh, depends what I'm doing. If, for example, if I'm playing with uh, I'm playing with a band called Bedrock, which is a sort of '80s rock band that did some touring with Saga, and I'm playing with Jerry Johnson, obviously. Uh, Jerry's kind of a trio blues-based thing, so I'm using a six-piece kit. Yeah. I'm using uh, four toms, kick, snare, and and various amount of cymbals and stuff. Uh, for my own stuff, I used my full-on big kit, which is two bass drums, six toms, lots of cymbals. Right. And uh, so basically what I did is I, I close mic all the toms, so that's six just to start. Snare, I, I had three mics on the snare, top, middle, and bottom. And I have this spe yeah. special snare drum that has a hole all the way around nice. the middle, so I had a mic on that. Then uh, hi-hat mic. Uh, ride symbol, three overheads, and then we get into, uh, and this is part of what I discovered from becoming an engineer to record drums, room mics. Right. And I had three different room mics and I had three overheads. So I had a whole pile of different microphones and the room mics, the, the key to a great drum sound is actually the room mics. Yeah. You know, that's where you get the power. The power of a drum kit is not the close mic. It's the, the room air. mic. Yeah. It's the sound of the drums in the room. And that's why I, I went to that room, because I love the sound of it. Right. right. All right. We're going to burn one. Brian, I want you to fire up uh, track two, which is Catch My Fall. And you can get this on Steve Nagus's CD, Dare to Dream. And you're hearing it right here at barbershoppodcast.com. Oh, 
place in the heart Transcending all our yesterdays Hold me now, I'm falling down To be lost in your arms In the blue of your eyes It's a place where I can hide away Catch my fall. Catch Very, my fall. Catch my fall. So tell me, uh, you, you, you were mentioning to me about how the process was writing this album, where you were co-writing this album, and obviously some soaring, searing vocals. And your, um, the, the, the fellow who's singing, what's his name? Uh, Al Langlade. Al Langlade is writing the lyrics, and you're writing the music back and forth. Yeah. So this is a, an instance where he's obviously got a, catch your groove and feed off of what you're what you're writing and i guess you're probably you know modifying what you're playing when you're getting things back because i guess it's more like a conversation it is it's a give and take and and files flew back and forth over the net regularly and what i would do is i would put together a musical idea uh with this one here it was catch my fall was actually the only song on the album where we actually finished it in the same room but I had uh, I had the melodies and the whole thing sketched out on guitar, and uh, I played it for him, and then he came up with the the, the lyrics and the eventual hooks and stuff. Uh, the rest of it, we we would just exchange notes. So I would send him a piece of music, and he would put some vocals down on it, just uh, rough ideas, and then I would send him notes on those, and then he would go back and change it and send it back, and and that's why it took me a couple of years to get this album done. 
Yeah, and this process has changed over the years, how you write and record music. It's like going into a, a, a studio that was brick and mortar with two-inch tape machines and, and hardwood floors. That isn't, that isn't necessarily a, a that viable option anymore. That's right. That's right. It's certainly not. Um, computers, again, this is the good side of computers. Is it's enabled us to, uh, to have a lot of tools that we wouldn't have normally had our hands on to be, access to to use in the old days. You would have to go into a big studio to get that stuff. Right now, it's available, readily available for anybody using a PC, and uh, I embrace that technology. It's wonderful. I mean, we were talking in in the break there about uh, compressors and stuff right. like that. I got racks and racks of stuff that I use with my recording setup that are very recognizable from 1960. Yeah. You know, and 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 the people at the at the uh, at the consumer end listening to it, they may not understand, but you know, you know, Ryan, there's like there's a, there's quite a market in for modeling, you know, computer being able to emulate what a sine wave was from a certain piece of equipment, and then quite often it comes down to what kind of uh, pulp the capacitor was made out of, exactly, and and how the tonality is affected by something, and it's it's really that finite that it it, it can make a big difference. It is. There's a company called Universal Audio that makes some special cards for recording uh, plugins, and they they actually have all my favorite pieces. So the old Neve EQs and compressors, the 1176 compressor, LA-2A. These are things that I would go to in any yeah. world-class studio and put them, for example, in LA-2A as a compressor, hmm. pretty much for vocals. And I have, I can use 15 of them if I want. Yeah, yes, I, and now, and but <clears throat> the actual real, like people have to get an understanding, how much would a good studio preamp cost? $10,000? The, uh, well, I have some Neve copies that are, uh, <clears throat> a Neve, e uh, Neve um, mic pre is about 3500 bucks per channel. Per channel, right. And same with the EQs. I have uh, four uh, Neve copy eqs as well it's about the same price yeah so this is something that it's, it's very real when you have to look at how you can record something you know if you want the sound you want you need to have the bucks and to have a a plug-in or a computer emulation of that gives you uh, a nice advantage if you have a creative mind it certainly does yeah it certainly does to do that okay we're going to do something that we haven't done uh on the barbershop yet this is uh episode 18 ryan i think it's episode 18 yep um, 17. 17. This is episode number 17. And uh, I'm going to drop some vinyl. Um, we've got a, a good collection of vinyl down here. Um, and a lot of um, people are, I know this, this is driving uh, Steve crazy because Steve is like, doesn't see the romanticism and the I hate equality. Vinyl. <laughs> he hates vinyl. He likes digital. He likes it floating through the air in ones and zeros. We might have picked the wrong time yeah. to debut this. <laughs> We're dragging a rock around a piece of plastic and the rock's going to win. That's good though because I'm with you on that. You know, yeah. I've, oh, I've never understood that vinyl is better. I, you know, I can listen to a nice high end audio file and it's just i can't take it with that hiss and the click and i don't know i'm the, not a vinyl the bacon purist. sizzling in the pan doesn't do it for you not right? for no <laughs> well, I, I just can't believe uh the actual process when you when you record to vinyl we used to record to two inch and then we would mix it down to quarter inch tape or mm -hmm. half inch tape uh, and every time you do that, you lose a generation, so you get more noise, and the cha the sound changes. The bottom end gets bumped, and the top gets bumped. And then you go into uh, uh, we used to go into the lacquer channel in Toronto, and uh, then you go through this whole process of of transferring from tape to vinyl, and you have to cut the whole side contiguous. You can't stop. Right. So we're making EQ changes on the fly, and then we would get to the end, and basically it's one groove all the way. So the harder you cut it, the wider the grooves. And we had, with the Saga stuff, it was long tracks, long sides. We get to the end, it wouldn't fit. <laughs> and you wouldn't know that till the end. No, <laughs> and it, so we'd have to start again. And in fact, uh, we did this for two weeks trying to cut the first album. 
and the engineer checked himself in right after he finished our album. <laughs> <laughs> By that, it means a little mental rest. The, in the stress hospital. was unbelievable. It was just terrible. Well, you know what? I think I see that as an investment in some of it. Esoteric as it may be, I'm, uh, you know, I'm going to give a thumbs up because, you know what? It's for, for someone to hold on to it and lug around that piece of melted dinosaur bone <laughs> and to drag that rock around it. I'm going to play cut. This album has not been played. I bought it uh, last year. My friend uh, Selena Martin came uh, into Rebels Rock and she was selling albums. And uh, I got a CD with it. Uh, for 20 bucks and I've never had an opportunity to play it yet so this is actually it might sound pristine because this is the first time this pristine this, this, this yeah, record has ever played oh. it's not it's going to be absolutely perfect <laughs> so this is the hottest day from Selena Martin on barbershoppodcast.com chick chick And cool. that's the hottest day. <laughs> Selena Martin, it's not so bad. Oh, man, I'm having night flashbacks, flashbacks, flashbacks to the old days. Oh, my Steve, you God. see, Steve's the cutting edge, and he's not going to go back and say, I remember when records were so great. He's oh, like, no. Uh, he uh, likes he likes the, the smoothness, the cleanness, the convenience, the portability of the yeah. digital era. So how has the digital era, how has music changed? Like, how do you see music today and where it's going? Well, uh, I think... It's funny because what what's happening again? You have kind of two sides. You have the actual recording side, uh, as computers get cheaper, faster, uh, smaller. Uh, you have uh, incredible amount of technology at your disposal. Uh, you know, so that the the uh, the recording bit rates have changed. Uh, initially, a, a CD was is forty four point one sixteen bit. 
Now you can go 24-bit, you can go 32-bit, you can even start to go 64-bit, uh, which every time you go up, you get better quality sound. Uh, but what's happening is, is on the consumer side, people are listening to MP3s. An MP3 is not even uh, the same quality as a CD yeah. was. So it's compressed. It's basically what they do, and it's 10 to 1 compression. Yeah. So it's one-tenth the quality of... A, of but it's one-tenth the, the, the memory space, and that's the selling point. Of exactly. It, right? You can put a lot of them on your player. That's right. So uh, because of that, I mean, people... We got into Napster and... and uh, all the free downloads. The new generation of kids have grown up thinking that music is free. Yeah. Because they can just go on the net and they can get whatever they want. So they can get thousands of songs and they can fit it on a little player about the size of a cigarette lighter. And uh, so it, it doesn't have an intrinsic value, right? It's, it's become disposable. So basically they can, this week they can download a thousand songs. And then next week they can dump them all and download yeah. another thousand. Yeah. Uh, and and they just throw it away. It's like the bags that milk come yeah. in, right? You know, you get your your three bags of milk and you take the little plastic container, uh, the bag that they came in, and yeah. you put it in the recycle. Yeah. Well, they don't even recycle the songs anymore. It they just goes into thin air. Wipe the memory and yeah. it's gone. So, uh, so on one side you've got technology that's really enabling us to do. It's empowering us to, to, to have better quality. But on the street with the kids, it's going completely the other way. Yeah. You know, so it's kind of a, it's a catch-22. I mean, you, you know, you, you, there's no point going to that higher technology and getting this great sound because nobody's ever going to hear it. Nobody, yeah. But you got to figure the older folks like us do, you know, just because our ears are getting worse, you know. Well, the old folks like <laughs> us still like vinyl. We, it's true, but I'm saying, <laughs> and our CDs, we don't want to throw them out. We'll carry those milk cartons around for as long as it takes. We're emotionally attached to the old technology, and what we love about vinyl is the packaging. Yes, and the memories that it holds. Yes, and, and it's that tactile thing of holding it in your hand with a 12-inch square piece of... of uh, artwork, too. Artwork, yeah. yes. And pictures and, and liner notes and lyrics. And and on that note, sorry, I didn't, but but on, on the Dare to Dream, Steve, you put the lyrics in here, which is something I always uh, laud, and I know it's an extra expense, sometimes an extra hassle, but clearly the lyrics are very important, you know, that people aren't can't be expected to pick up the lyrics and... You know, just off the fly, and having them is is nice for people. Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, uh, we're old school. We're we're attached to those things that that. Uh, but we grew up when in an age when music was special, and we looked forward to uh, a new release, uh, to the point where we would actually wait at the record store for it to show up so yeah. we could go get it or drive into the next town that has it before our town has exactly it, if we lived, that's you know. gone those yeah. days are gone music is completely disposable now yeah. and and it's really a shame you know and that's why i mean uh live events aren't are not supported uh on a local level like like they used to you used to go to a club and if if one of your favorite bands was playing it would be packed yeah and they could play several nights. Now it's like you go to a club, you can shoot a gun off and not hit anybody. Yeah. You know, so the attachment to music, uh, we've all become uh, not so much us as the old generation, but the, the younger kids are not attached to music. For example, my son is 19. I asked him uh, if he knew who Paul McCartney was. He's going, I I've heard the name. He has no idea. Yeah. So uh, you talk to anybody in our generation, oh, Paul McCartney, the Beatles. Yeah. I saw the Beatles in 64 at the gardens. Yeah. Yeah. It was special. It was so special that, that it left a lasting impression on me that I still to this day can picture that being in Maple Leaf Gardens, watching the Beatles play. Yeah. And it was incredible. But on, on that note, it's funny because we had a couple of weeks ago, we had Jack Peddler in and he talked about when they saw the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show and his dad being, you know, such a musician he was, saw that and went, it's over. If these monkeys can go and play that, you know. So here's someone who came from a generation where the musicianship was so slick 
that they saw that as primal, you yeah. know, very much not the way that it hooked into us who are the old guys now. I think a lot of us have stories. I, I can remember myself watching the Ed Sullivan show and the Beatles were on. And my dad was saying, ah, they're flashing the pan. They'll be gone in a year or so. And I bet him. I said, Dad, I'll bet you 10 bucks these guys are still around in 10 years. And uh, I actually collected on that bet. <laughs> he paid up. 20 man. years later. <laughs> I went to him. I said, you and I made a bet about that Ed Sullivan <laughs> performance of the Beatles. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I think Paul McCartney would like that. Well, we got uh, we got time to play one more um, tune off of your uh, Dare to Dream CD, and I want to play the title track, Dare to Dream. And and you know, I think you you put it very succinctly. That's really what it's about, isn't it? It's totally about that. Uh, this is the reason that that I still make music. You know, I'm now fifty years plus into my career as a musician, as a songwriter, as a producer, all of the above. Uh, I still am like a kid. I see an, a cool drum kit and I go, wow. Yeah. Right? And Dare to Dream is what it's all about. That Those are the things that, that keep me motivated to do what I do. Oh. And, and hence the title and track. Hence the, the title. Album. And it's uh, one of the things that keeps uh, Ryan and I doing uh, what we do because we love to bring this kind of thing to you, expose ourselves and everyone else who's uh, watching or listening to the Barbershop podcast. And uh, so we're going to play the title cut off of uh, Steve Nagus, Dare to Dream. And this is it on barbershoppodcast.com.
Dare to Dream, title track of Steve Nagus's solo debut album. Steve, I want to thank you for coming in the studio. It's been a real buzz having you today. It's been a real pleasure to be here. It's it's fun. It's fun to tell stories, isn't it? It is. I mean, that that's a big part of it. And we just scratched the surface. No pun intended. No pun intended. <laughs> uh, you know, when I look back on it, of fifty years of making music. Some of the stories that make your hair stand up, but I think we we covered a, a fair amount of ground in a in a short period in that, of time. In that time, period of time, so. and you wouldn't change it for the world, I don't think. You know, it's like you've got you've earned yourself a great reputation, and uh, proud to have you on the show, Ryan. Again, thanks for helping out and doing your thing, making me sound good. Anytime. No one can help make me look good. If you want to donate a, <laughs> a higher price camera, maybe yeah, that'll help a little bit. But uh, next week, barbershoppodcast dot com. We've got Mr. Dave Rave coming in the studio. Uh, the original wild man of Hamilton. He is. And uh, he's uh, he's just fresh off his uh, coming from the States, and he's going to have some new material, and he's going to have some stories. Uh, in the meantime, want to thank you for coming out. Uh, for Steve Nagus and Ryan Cannon, I'm Kevin Barber. Have a good one. No, it is.